back, everyone, to the first talk of the day in here after the keynote. Um, we have Peter Janu. Peter is the CEO of Secure Code Warrior. And it's a good link on from this Keep's uh, keynote is because um, Peter used to be, uh, he still is a SANS instructor, quite an active SANS instructor. And you've got how many SANS certificates? Many, many, many. Um, and he's here today to talk about um, why positive security is the next game changer. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to be honest, I'm absolutely terrified standing here in front and doing public speaking. I'm, I really don't like doing it, but marketing basically put me up for this job, so um, let's, see, let's see what comes out. Now, for the people that don't know me, um, I, I, I created one slide on um, my, my basic career. Now, this graph shows you the two most important things in, uh, in a career. Line number one, which is the red one, is a job satisfaction. I basically started uh, early 2000s in this space. So line number one is job satisfaction. Line number two is the salary and what you basically earn. Now, I started around uh, early 2000s in cybersecurity. Now, the only thing I was doing in 2000 was breaking stuff. It was the cool thing to do. We were the hackers. We were breaking. It's really good in year one. Uh, year two, it starts to become repetitive because you find another injection attack. You find another hole, you pop another shell. So you can clearly see that my job satisfaction went down, down, down. And about seven or eight years later, there was this cross point between my salary was going up, but I didn't like my job anymore. Um, what I did, I, I actually started teaching, uh, as Pamela said, I started teaching for SANS. That gave me a little bit more satisfaction because I could suddenly like distribute my knowledge to all these people and I saw all these um, little mini hackers popping up and started working in the industry, which is really satisfying uh, to actually see. One of my students actually came up about a half hour ago and he thanked me for all the knowledge I gave him in this course. So that basically helped my salary, but it also helped my job satisfaction. Now you can clearly see 2014, 2015, something drastically happened in my career. My job satisfaction was at a low point, my salary was at a high point, I felt that I was um, really not doing anything useful for this industry. So in 2015, um, I thought about the AppSec problem, I thought about the development problem and, and thinking about well, how was it possible that after 18 years or after 15 years, we still had so many vulnerabilities that were history. Like they were, they were 1999's kind of vulnerabilities and they're still there. So I basically took a bold move and started um, a thing that maybe I shouldn't have done, but is basically doing a startup. I started building a product with a crazy idea with some of two or three of my ex-colleagues. Now you can clearly see I had no salary at all in 2015, 16, and now I'm finally kind of getting into a, uh, a space where I can uh, pay for food and stuff anymore, but my job satisfaction is going up really well. So all in all, it's a really, really great journey. So that's a bit of a summary of myself. Now, the other graph that I want to show you is the hairline. Um, <laughs> You can clearly see the impact of 15 years of cybersecurity. Anyways, as I said, marketing put me up for this talk. They created a really um, interesting slide deck for me that they gave me about four days ago. Um, I removed every single slide of them except for this one because they were just pitching my product and I was like, that's not gonna go down very well with this audience. Um, so I promise, yes, I'm a vendor, yes, I sell stuff, um, but I promise I won't be pitching my product. Now, one thing that they did do well is I was on a conference in Singapore about a month ago. I was listening to a vendor talking and we were around the table with two people from Barclays and the two guys were like, I bet you that guy is going to say applied um, or machine intelligence and machine learning in the next five minutes. And that's where we came down with the idea of buzzword bingo. So you can see the buzzwords on the screen. If I say three of those buzzwords in this presentation and somebody shouts bingo, you can have free drinks all night uh, tonight on, uh, on the OWASP party and I'll shout. Good. Now, did you, did you get them? Good. Well, marketing told me I had to have flyers with those printed out, but I forgot them, so sorry for that. But anyways. Um, today's challenge is in AppSec. Um, I'm not sure if you know, but today we have about 22 million developers around the, on this planet. 
In 2020, which is an exactly two or three years, they estimate it's going to be 25 million. So we have 25 million people writing software that is basically powering the world. Now, in my opinion, software engineering is one of the only studies you can do at university where nobody talks or teaches you about security or safety. If you look at any other engineering um, degree that exists out there, think about civil engineering, they build bridges, they build houses. In all of that course material, if you build a bridge, they teach you about how to build a safe and a secure bridge. Because if you build a bridge and you don't care about it, people die and that's a problem. But in software engineering, nobody cares. If you talk to the academics, they were like, well, no, security is something you should learn on the, do on the job. In your first year when you start working as a developer, that's where you get confronted with security. So we basically have roughly 22 million people out there today that have not been properly trained on secure coding or on, on what are good coding patterns in, uh, in development, which is a scary thought. Now, those 22 million people, they also are writing roughly about 111 billion lines of code. Now, I didn't count those lines of code myself. I actually stole that statistic from CSO Online. Don't ask me how this guy came up with the number, if he counted that manually or whatever, I don't know. But 111 billion lines of code are being written every single year. Now, the following statistics I found from this very reputable source, which is Stack Overflow. Um, they basically say that every 100,000 lines of code, there's about two to eight exploitable security bugs being written. So if you write about 100,000 lines of code, there's at least two, but roughly eight security, exploitable security vulnerabilities in this code. Now, if you combine the previous statistics of 1,100 billion lines of code written every year, and this Stack Overflow thing, it roughly comes down that we are releasing code with roughly 2 million exploitable security bugs every single year, which is a scary thought, knowing that software is basically powering our cars, your economy, and so on. Now, if you don't believe me, well, look at some of the other stats. Um, DHS in the US basically came down saying, hey, 90% of all security incidents, you can trace them back to a fault in the design or in the code. Um, Verizon, data breach report, they say 21% of all the data breaches happens by a design flaw or a problem in the code. Now, the 21% itself is not that scary, but the fact that this finding has been in the report for the past 10 years and it's not going down, that is a very scary thought. And then the last one, um, I'm sure everybody has heard about famous SQL injection thing. Cisco basically claims that one in three applications that they still scan over the past five years still has this nasty bug in it. Now this thing is really old, really, really old, and it makes Mario very, very sad seeing that stuff. Anyways, how did we end up in this situation? Like, we are 2018, how is it possible that we have all those bad statistics out there? Now, AppSec in 2000, when I started out, it was basically, people were using the internet to create branding websites, marketing websites. AppSec was basically non-existing. Um, cybersecurity even, you couldn't mention the name cybersecurity because people, people went berserk over the word cyber. It was information security or IT security. But at that time, nobody cared about AppSec. There were hackers, yes, they were breaking in. Um, they were using software vulnerabilities, think about the format string attacks, the buffer overflow attacks, all that kind of stuff. People might remember Frack Magazine as being one of the main um, magazines that were teaching people about security. Now, what did happen in 2000 or roughly in 2003, OWASP started, I think the foundation was started then, they brought out their uh, first OWASP top 10 as well. So you see that around 2000, this AppSec thing started becoming very popular in the security and the research area. You might also know that things like SQL injection were found in 1999, was first published in Frack magazine. You had cross-site scripting also around 2000. You have the famous um, Unicode command injection NT4, which was direct traversal stuff comb combined with command injection, also happened around 2000. Now, organization itself, they obviously didn't care too much about security at that point in time, or AppSec at, at that time. 
Um, and pen testing at that time was black magic. Like if you had to do pen testing in that space, there was no Metasploit, there was no Nessus, there was some version of Nmap, but basically you were trading exploits in the underground and calling up your friends asking if you had an exploit for Red Hat 6.2, and you started trading in, uh, in that area. So it was really black magic. Now, between 2000 and 2010, <laughs> Yeah, I just randomly injected these funny GIFs in it. They have nothing to do with my presentation, but I thought it was a, was a great laugh. But anyways, um, in 2010, um, things started to change. Um, AppSec, or the internet, was going web, was going mobile, web 2.0, mobile. Everybody started using um, uh, web services, consumers, transactions, all that kind of stuff. Now, security, or AppSec, became more, um, more prevalent in the corporate world. You might remember static code analysis tools, like the Fortify started out 2010 with, the, with some of their releases. So these were basically scanners looking for problems inside code. Um, you, some of you might remember as well web application firewalls. Um, that's kind of a technology they put down there in 2010 saying they're gonna stop all application attacks. Now, in my professional opinion, since 2010, I've never seen anyone activate a WAF in production in blocking mode. So I think people are still running that thing into monitoring mode. So very inefficient and effective stuff. And um, if you were asking somebody, what are you doing about security? The standard answer was like, we do pen testing, right? That's the, whole, the, the, the thing you, you basically, you, you write an application, and to make sure it's secure, you're gonna hire this guy here that has certifications, has credentials, and he's gonna come in, and he's basically gonna tell us how bad our code is in. That was um, AppSec in 2010. Now, between 2010 and now, we had PCR compliance, data breaches, we had millions of records lost, we had Putin as well that came in power, um, and we're now in 2018, where AppSec has, um, is evolving. AppSec is basically getting more important in, in, in organizations. You can see that um, there are technologies like the static code analysis tools are still there. Yes, it's 10-year-old technology, but people spending still a lot of money on those static code analysis tools. You can also see things like RAS popping up. Um, so there are runtime application security protection tools. Think about signal sciences, brevity, uh, contrast. I'm not saying any of, the, any of them are better or not, but it's basically they're putting technology in front in production to try and stop application security attacks. A bunch of other acronyms that are happening. You have dynamic application security testing. You have IS that's in there. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that are people talking about DevSecOps, containerization, security pipelining, and the whole shift left movement. So if you kind of look today, this is what a typical AppSec person deals with on, um, on, a, on a daily basis in, uh, in his job. Now I'll, I'll talk about more about that later. Now this is the alphabet soup. If you didn't know, there's actually an alphabet soup generator online. I found that last night because I was thinking, which funny image do I put in? Um, you can actually put in whatever word you want and it generates this uh, nice looking soup. Um, now, what are some of the challenges that AppSec is facing today? Now, this is probably gonna make me very unpopular with the, um, the, the pen testers in the room. Um, but I think pen testing after 18 years still sucks. You have pen testers, and I'm not saying everyone, but most of them, they come in, and you have these developers, and they've created this magical little baby with all the features that are looking fancy and shiny, and you have this big bear from a security expert coming in with all these OECP certificates, CREST certificates, whatever, and they basically break down that application. They basically completely rip it down. Um, so they're basically coming in and telling the developer how ugly his baby is. As you can imagine, most people don't like that. Most people don't really like penetration testers, and that's exactly for that reason. Because pen testers, they come in, they basically break the application, and then they say, hey, now it's your problem to go and fix it. If you ask the average pen tester, I'm not saying everyone, the average pen tester, can you actually help me fixing this problem? Most of them, they come back with this generic answer, and they say, yeah, sure, data validation input validation, and that's the only advice they can give. Most penetration testers, if you ask them, hey, SQL injection, you know how SQL injection works, now how do you fix it in Python Django? 
I bet you most of them won't know. How do you fix it in Java Spring? They won't know. How do you fix it in C Sharp and VC? They usually have no idea on how to fix these things. And I think that is why pen testing today still sucks is because they come in and they tell you how bad your software is or how ugly your baby is, but they don't help you fixing the problem. And the main reason for that is because you basically, pen testers, they are breakers. They're really good into finding flaws, really good into breaking stuff, using very difficult words to start describing what they found. But they speak a different language from the developers. Developers, they speak in frameworks, they speak in classes, in abstracts, in functions, all that kind of stuff. And the developers don't understand what a pen tester is trying to say. The typical developer has no idea what object deserialization is, what XSS or IDOR is. And the pen testers, they don't speak the development language and they have no, not much experience in that area. So to me, today the challenge is still is trying to, to cross that bridge or that gap between the security experts and the actual developers so that they start um, uh, speaking the same language. So that's one of the challenges that I can see today. Um, another one, this is how probably the average AppSec person feels in an organization. They're getting squeezed, <laughs> they're getting squeezed to the business and the speed of the business that wants to release 20 times, do 20 code drops a day, but they're getting squeezed between security as well because they need to make sure that everything that developers are releasing or are dropping in production is actually secure. Now, on average, there's about, oops, there's about one AppSec person for 200 developers. Now, even one in 200 is a very good uh, ratio. Um, most people, like if I look to the average banks here in Australia, they might have a team of roughly, I would say, five to 10 AppSec guys that are full-time busy with AppSec and there's 4,000 to 5,000 developers. And they're hiring developers way faster than they're hiring AppSec people. So this guy, this AppSec expert, has a big scale problem because he can roughly only spend one day a year on one developer to make sure that that one developer actually produces secure code. So he can't police that guy. He, can really, he can't really help um, everyone with the current way on how we're doing security in an organization. That guy cannot check the code of everyone and making sure it is secure when you're working into an agile environment. When you do waterfall, you can probably, we, we've gotten away with it for the past 20 years. You six months to release, at the end you get the AppSec guys in and they basically fix the problem. But if you do 20 code drops a day, you cannot do this the way on how we've been doing it for the past uh, 18 years. Now, you might say security pipelining. That's coming up, right? It's very interesting. People are, they want to start building a pipeline where security gets built in. Now, I was just talking with somebody from Tyro Payments that was exactly confirming what I was saying, is that, yes, you can probably build a security pipeline, but the tools at the moment are very immature. They um, only work for one single framework. And nowadays in an organization, when running microservices, when, my, when running so many different frameworks and uh, programming languages, you, just, you don't have a tool that will work for every single of those technologies. So yes, you can probably build a pipeline that were great for PHP or for Python Django, but at the moment there's no pipeline that you can create um, that kind of covers all the stacks that, an, that a typical organization is, uh, is starting to use. So it, it's a very promising concept, but I think it's still very much um, in, uh, in its infancy. Now, the other thing is, in my opinion, most of the security tools that are being used today are not really good as well. Um, my experiences with most static code analysis is really negative in the sense that you need to be a security expert in order to run them. So you can't really give that to a developer because whatever comes out of that tool is basically security language. There's, there's very often not enough guidance in none of the static code analysis tools that says, hey, this is how you fix the problem. Most of them do the same as the pen testers do. They say input validation, data validation, and they give you a generic recommendation for Java, but you're coding in Java Spring Boot which is a completely different um, um, uh, way on how to solve these things. 
So there are some interesting evolvements happening. I was on AppSec USA about a few weeks ago and I ran into a German company that had a static code analysis tool. And what they're doing is they're scanning the code, but after the scan, they will figure out what framework is being used and they will automatically create a patch or a, um, a patch for that specific language. Now, if somebody can make that work, that would be beautiful because you use the scanner, you basically, the, the scan runs and at the end you get basically something that you can immediately commit in your code and problem goes away. But until we figure that out, I still think that static code analysis has a lot of, um, a lot of problems. Now, um, the, the signal scientists guys that are outside are probably not going to like me hearing saying this, but if you look at the RASP technology today, that will work for .NET, won't work for Django or won't work for Java. They're very specific on certain frameworks. Now, these guys are trying to kind of get as much framework coverage as possible, but the average bank runs about 200 applications in COBOL. Now, I can assure you there's not a single RASP technology that is currently supporting COBOL. And they will probably never support COBOL as well. So, my opinion, I've seen RAS being deployed, but usually it's in monitoring mode. It's never going to be in blocking mode because the impact on the business is just uh, too wide. And I honestly don't believe we can solve this problem by putting technology in front of a weak application because RASP is basically saying, hey, yes, you can write insecure software. You know what? At the end, we'll put this technology in front of it and problems will go away. I, I simply don't believe that the, that, that will be possible um, at this point in time. Most of the toolings that are out there for AppSec, their reports are inaccurate, often very useless uh, advice. Now, one of the last challenges um, that, uh, that I've noticed is what I call the black hole of security knowledge. Now, what I mean with that is, let's say you have security testing um, activities. SAS, DAS, pen testing, bug bounties, all that kind of stuff. They give you a list of vulnerabilities that need to be fixed. Now, you as an AppSec guy, you take that vulnerability and you go to a developer, a single developer, and you ask him, hey, can you actually fix these vulnerabilities for me? Now, that guy, he might be trained in security or he might do research. He basically fixes these things. Usually, if there's enough pressure for the business, they will fix those problems. Now, what happens with that knowledge? What happens once that one guy, that single guy in your team of 500 people, that single guy know, now knows how to fix an XML injection? But is anyone actually taking the effort of, of distributing that knowledge to everyone else in, 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 in the team? My opinion never happens. And that is one of the exact reasons why we're still seeing bugs that are 20 years old, basically the recurrent bugs, the ones that you fixed two years ago, and they're suddenly coming back. Because nobody has distributed the knowledge across developers to say, hey, if we want to avoid these kind of vulnerabilities, this is a good coding pattern we could use. And that's from now on, that's the coding pattern you need to use to move forward. Nobody is doing that, so the knowledge that, that we gain or that we create while fixing bugs, they go into a black hole, and if that guy leaves the organization, you just lose, lose that kind of knowledge. So um, you can definitely see that because there is about 125 vulnerabilities that are keep coming back all the time, and anyone that has been in pen testing for longer than three or four years, they know how boring pen testing gets because you see the same thing coming back every single time. Most organizations, the scanners, they're spitting out the same vulnerabilities. It's an easy problem to fix, but I wonder why nobody is really taking the effort of, uh, of pushing that knowledge to developers. So, my opinion, this is how most organizations are approaching AppSec. They're basically trying to fix a problem, but there's so many uh, in volume, the same ones that are coming back, that it is really difficult to scale. Now, um, I didn't want to only talk about um, the problems. I also want to um, kind of give you some ideas on how to fix these things. So if you're an AppSec Pro, how can you actually make things scale and, and, and make an impact? Now, the first thing is an obvious one. If you work with pen testers, whether they are insourced or outsourced, make sure they do a better job of 
fixing the vulnerability. When I was teaching SANS courses, I was teaching the hacking courses for SANS. And every single time I was teaching those courses, I told the pen testers, your job is not to find the vulnerabilities. Your job is to help them fix them. Because only then the problem goes away. You can't just come in and say, hey, your baby is ugly, and then step away and basically not helping the person. So pen testers should focus on fixing stuff, change their attitude. Um, they should do more than just say input validation. If possible, they can create JIRA tickets automatically. They find a bug, file a JIRA ticket, and actually provide advice specifically for the framework on how to fix these kind of things. Now, in the future world, the pen tester might get so, um, in, or, or so embedded into the development team that they can actually create pull requests to fix the problems themselves. Now, if we actually manage to do that, then I think pen testing will become something which is uh, very valuable. So for now, when you work with penetration testers, my, my ask is, less finding problems, more fixing and security engineering. Um, the second one is, as an industry, we've talked about weaknesses a lot. If you look at the OAS top 10, what is the OAS top 10? It's basically weaknesses, it's the negativity, it's the bad stuff, it's basically showing, hey, this is how people can break in. Now. Why are we as an industry always focused on the negatives while there are so many proactive stuff you can do? Like OWASP has two projects, the proactive controls for developers and also the application security verification standards. Now these things don't talk about the negativities, they don't talk about what is bad, but they're basically showing developers how to securely code, what are the good coding patterns you should, should apply, what should you do to protect sensitive data in transport. What should you do to talk to a database and make sure that nobody can do bad code, uh, bad things in your code? So um, the whole industry is always talking about, hey, we're OWASP top 10 compliant. Like, that doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Like what you should do is you start focusing on the proactive controls and making sure that you can say, hey, we're actually implementing these controls. And in that way, that will give us a good framework to know how good or how bad our code is. Now then one of the last things that, that I want to talk about before um, finishing off is um, the distribution of some of the knowledge. So the following scenario, you have AppSec guys. They usually know how or what the concepts are behind secure coding. They will come back and say, hey, we're gonna, we have these secure coding guidelines. And these are two examples, just, hey, you need to use application login, you need to use where, what, when, who, and why. So whatever you do in the application from a business level, that is one of the standards we need to do. You need to log that. The second one could be, hey, you need to use context on coding. Now the problem today is most organizations have these things, paper-based, on a PDF, somewhere on the internet, hidden from the developer. So if a developer is coding, I was speaking with somebody in New York, Morgan Stanley, and he basically said, my developers, when they want to find the secure coding guidelines, they have to open up the internet, they have to search the internet, they find the page, then they have to download the PDF, open up the PDF, scroll in the PDF, find the right section, and that's where we kind of tell them what secure coding needs to look like. Now, who's going to do that while he's building the application? Nobody. So the way on how that currently gets distributed um, results into nobody caring about secure coding guidelines and nobody really um, adhering to them either. So in my opinion, what should happen is that these coding guidelines, at first, the first step is they need to be translated from the concept of the, the, the abstract. They need to be, be translated into specific um, actionable pieces of code in a certain project. So if you're building a new online trading platform or a new website and you're building them in, in, in whatever, in React or in Python Django, what should happen is somebody, either it's a developer, the security champion, or the AppSec guy, somebody that has knowledge about that framework should actually take those coding guidelines and say, hey, if you want to do logging in our framework, you should be using the secure logger log object. So you basically, you're defining what is the good coding pattern in this framework that links back to that secure coding guideline. Um, the same with um, using secure libraries. You can basically write a guideline or write a rule that said, hey, 
in Java Spring, we need to stop using Get Parameter. We need to start using one of our internal libraries use Get Parameter. Why? Because we've built in security controls in that library so that the developer doesn't need to think anymore about security. And basically, we have a library that takes care of those things. Think about OWASP API is one of the, the projects that um, was done in 2010 uh, with exactly that goal. So that is how you as an AppSec guy, you can create support pages, internet pages, you can even commit some of those good coding patterns into the project so that developers can start using these things very easily. Now, sometimes that's not enough and we can even go a step further and that's honestly where I think this industry is gonna go into, is that once you have those rules, or once you have those good coding patterns, when a developer is gonna commit this code, is gonna send it to a repository, at that point in time, your AppSec, your security pipeline, your checks, your Travis, your Jenkins, or whatever you're kind of using, at that moment, you can start checking, well, what is happening? Is he submitting code that is adhering to those good coding patterns? And if not, we can do a few things. If a developer submits code that is not using our secure logger object, we can do, well, either one, we can refuse its commit and we can say, hey, you can't commit this code because you still have a violation against our good coding patterns. Or you can say, hey, we don't want to slow down developers. What we're going to do is we're going to accept it, but we're going to automatically create a Jira ticket to say, hey, your code, explain me why you're not using this object. Explain me why you are using weak encryption or you're not using whatever. So you, you kind of create a ticket on their name automatically so that they get a kind of a get out of jail free card because not always will your secure coding line be applicable in a certain context or a situation. And in that way, you can start tracking some of those violations. Now, the third thing, what you can do is you can start giving points or you can gamify the whole process. People that are submitting good code that are not violating any of your rules, well, why don't you give them stars? Why don't you give you points? Frequent flyer secure coding points and then you can buy upgrades when you fly from Qantas or Melbourne to Sydney or something like that. I don't really know, but the gamification aspect makes a, an incentive for developers to actually adhere to those things. Um, then the last thing, learning from mistakes. Um, I think I already mentioned this before, but let's say that AppSec finds a vulnerability. Hey, you're not, you're transferring sensitive data. Um, you're not even encrypting them. So fix that issue. Now that developer who fixes the issue, who takes the time to research, he might say, hey, we're gonna use some version of TLS and now we're gonna define that as a good coding pattern. So he can start taking that fix that he just developed for that specific vulnerability and he can convert that into a rule into a good coding uh, pattern and basically say, hey, now our good coding patterns, we're gonna start using TLS by default and he gives that, that knowledge and that guidance to everyone else in the organization. Now, in my opinion, that is how one AppSec guy can start managing 200, 500 to, to 1,000 developers as long as you provide the tools and the support for the developers to start uh, coding securely. <coughs> Yes, good. So you get free beers all night. Um, now, so what I want to finish off with um, is the key takeaways for me is that when you are in AppSec, you have to demand more or better security testing from your suppliers. Make them fix stuff. Don't make them just report problems. But also, you can only scale when you actually distribute knowledge. And in, there's, there's another example of companies in Australia that are starting to do that, that are holding awareness sessions with their developers, that are, that are organizing CTFs, that are gamifying stuff, that are doing brown, brown bag lunch sessions and so on. But ideally, it should be built in some of our tools. Think about IDE plugins that will pop up. Think about um, security pipelining stuff that will pop up and tell you when, um, when you're doing something wrong or when you need some kind of a, a guidance. And the last thing I think, put some fun into everything. So when you work with developers, make sure it is fun, it is engaging, because security has a very um, negative image in or negative reputation with software engineers, and that is something we need to change. So my opinion, secure developers are basically heroes. Thank you.
developers out there that just never got any security training. Um, I'm a developer, and I'd say that really the cultural problem starts a lot earlier than that. You have a lot of um, developers that have no real development training anyway. So, <laughs> uh -uh. so I feel better for me, like when I think about security as a developer, is that you basically um, have issues with maintainability already. So if you go to developers and say, I want you to worry about security, they go like, oh, we already have those 500 maintainability rules, uh, we can't add another test. How, how do you marry that up? Like, how do you make that a holistic approach that, that isn't seen as like, are you giving me that on top of all that style guide that I have for maintainability? <sighs> Very, very different question, but I, I fully agree with you. Like, the way on how we're training developers today in universities or whatever is is definitely not what gets what's useful in uh, in, in the profession. Um, now, I think step one, what we've tried to do in organizations, we try to first make developers aware on how important it is for them to deliver secure code. And yes, I I totally maintenance is important as well, but if you're writing. Um, code that is, let's say, powering a stock exchange or writing code that is um, uh, powering the new Tesla cars or whatever, they need to start understanding that security is not somebody else's responsibility. It's the analogy that I wanted to say with civil engineers as well. In my opinion, there's not a, a single civil engineer that's going to start building a house and then say at the end, hey, you know what, the safety of this house? Hire this guy and he's going to come and fix it. Or the safety of this bridge? No, not me, that's somebody else. And I think we're in kind of that mindset today is that it is, it is up, the way on how security has been built in an organization is always like, hey, AppSec or the security guys, we're going to do security, we're going to do this black magic pen testing stuff. And we're now have put us into a culture situation where developers, they have so much stuff on and they really don't feel accountable for either the security or, the, or sometimes even the quality of their code. So I think that's going to require a bit of a culture shift over the next few years. But I do think we should try and help developers understand that if they write code that is not secure, that it has a, loss, a lot of con um, uh, consequences and impact on um, the speed of deployment, on uh, the, the safety of personal data and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, to me, it's, it's a culture thing and it's gonna change over time and people realize that they need to deliver code which, which should be clean from the start. Any other questions? Uh, hi, so as you said, uh, there is not a lot of people doing these AppSec uh, security things. How is the pipeline going at the moment in terms of uh, training, uh, maybe even MIT university courses? How do we see the next 10 years in upskilling or training new talents in the industry? Is there anything else? Now, in my personal opinion, like what happens today in universities is that they train these developers and then they say, hey, we have these elective courses. Um, and their security. And you as an engineer, you need to opt in to follow a training course. To me, that is very, like, it, that, that is ridiculous. If we want to build in security into the engineers, into the DNA, we have to make it standard of their curriculum and make secure coding and secure coding patterns and good coding part of, um, of their curriculum by default. But when I speak to some of the universities, they're like, oh, there's no time. We have so many other things we need to do. We just can't fit everything in. So although I think universities can, could solve potentially this problem, I don't think that's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years because they're already a bit slow in adapting and, 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 and changing their, their curriculum on what's really needed in, in the professional world. And I think security is just not, not important enough today. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, but no, I don't see anything happening in that space, to be honest. Not in Australia, but also not outside of Australia, to be honest. Uh, I have a question. Um, how, I, I agree that there is a big gap between developers and like vendors in one monitoring uh, the code for uh, for vulnerabilities. How do you think is the best way to, to pass this knowledge? Like, the, the person who is scanning, finding these things, sometimes solving them, and the developer says, we have a Jira issue, fix this vulnerability on the solution. There has to be a channel on this solution, how, how to spread it, not this knowledge, because we want like this SQL injection that should never happen, it should pass from the people who are solving it into the developers, or, uh, or like, internet, that's like a two-way channel going 
how do you think is the best way to to make this knowledge go across the organization from whatever sources, from the person who is finding it or the person who is solving it? Like, how do you think is the best way to make this knowledge something that's seen? Because the more the more capable your developers are, the the less the less vulnerability you will find, right? That, so we can break that that gap between the one DevOps guy versus the 100, 200 developers, and then everyone is on the same page. Then the next time you say, oh, this should never happen because we already have something in place. You are aware of it. Like in my case, like I'm a half Dev, half DevOps, so I saw some of these things and now I realized I never tell my devs like, oh, look, this I I know how to solve this. Maybe if I if I give them quickly. Talks about you know oh, I saw this. Look, you should not do this. Yeah. How do you think is the best way to do that? So there's no simple answer on it because it kind of relates to what this person in front of saying was saying as well. Is developers have so many things to do that you can't go every week to them and say, hey, come to this one hour session and we'll train you on security. Like we typically when we use our platform is we say, well. We need about an hour a month and you, we, we need to get buy-in from the senior stakeholders in the company to say, hey, we're only asking for one hour a month, but this one hour, when you do it right, you can Im eliminate your top three vulnerabilities from the past 12 months because that cross-site scripting that we saw 12 months ago has come back five times in different teams. So give us one hour and we'll basically help you and show you a... Um, We'll, we'll do a one hour session that shows, hey, this is the impact of this vulnerability. Then this is how you can define a good coding pattern in Django, in C Sharp, and you basically give them the tools, you document it somewhere on the internet. There's some very good talks about the guys at Riot Games um, that are based in LA and in Ireland, how they basically created the support pages for their developers. Because they're one guy for those thousand developers, they create good coding patterns and they say, hey, if you need help with security, go to this page. And if they file a, J a JIRA ticket with a vulnerability, they link to their page and say, hey, if you want to know more about XML, external entity attacking, go there and you can find secure coding patterns that's going to help you. So that's one way on how you can do it scalable. I've seen examples in Australia where people just host lunch sessions every single month and choose one vulnerability and try to fix it. Because one of the mistakes I've seen made is saying, hey, we're going to use this session, we're going to do two hours, and we're going to explain the whole OWASP top 10, cram it in two hours, and check we're done for PCI DSS compliance. That typically doesn't work. Behind, behind. Thanks, um, Don't you think in the industry it's too much, oh, developers do this. So the developers first have to write the infrastructure code, they have to write secure code, they have to be aware of user experience, developer experience, design, they have to train themselves. Um, don't you think we put too much pressure and too much responsibility on developers? Because I hear this a lot. They should do this, they should do that. I think the pressure comes from the speed of business that you need to deploy with. Because I don't think we can say to a developer, hey, stop caring about infrastructure, stop caring about security, stop caring about quality, we'll just fix that problem for you because we've tried and that doesn't work. But where I think the pressure comes from is from the business people that say, we need this feature out within two weeks because it's going to impact our customers. And I think it's, it's, it's that awareness for the business that we say, hey, you know, if we do that, we are risking of doing bad code, bad patterns, security problems, all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, I would more take the pressure away from that side, which is going to be hard, but then, then basically taking away the responsibilities to build something which is uh, secure. Okay, I believe that's all the questions. Good, thank you. Have we got one more? Yeah, that's okay. This will be the last question. Once developers start putting good coding practices in, what would happen to pen testers? Out of a job. <laughs> Definitely. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, big round of applause for you. Thank you so much. Thank you.